All right, welcome back to 353. So, lab two, everyone having fun? So, no. <laughs> yeah, some of you may, at least some of you have been debugging for hours and hours and hours. Um, if you use Signal, go down to the end of the lab document and see those flags, use those flags, and that will save you a few hours by itself. Yeah. I have advice as well. Uh -huh. Don't mess up your file descriptors too, so. Yeah, do not mess up your file descriptors. They are hard to debug. Other useful tip, uh, the directory is a file descriptor, so don't close it while you're going over the directory. Bad idea. That's the major causes. Um, yeah, if you use a signal handler, remember at the end of the document, it says, hey, if you use a signal handler, what happens if things randomly start failing due to system calls and like just weird errors? It says flags restart. So remember when we had that lecture where we were trying to ignore signals and we had like read and then we got an error with like interrupted and we had to handle it. Well, there's a flag for the signal to prevent that from happening, like that SA restart thing. And it'll automatically restart any system call that gets interrupted so you don't have to deal with that. So that's one of the main causes of errors that I've seen so far. Other than that, it's been people messing up their file descriptors. <laughs> After that, you're golden. So yeah, when you're changing your file descriptors too, bit hard to debug because printf doesn't work. If you screwed up your file descriptors, printf also doesn't work, so that's fun. So one hacky thing you can do that kind of works is just exit with no numbers, so like exit with 42 or 43 or something like that, and then you can debug that way so you at least know where your child process made it to. Um, but yeah, other than that, that one's real fun to debug. <laughs> All right, speaking of fun to debug, let's continue. So, something that's a bit easier, we can go back to scheduling and see, you know, another scheduling scheme or algorithm we can use called dynamic priority scheduling. May also be called feedback scheduling in the textbook. And this is a way to have priorities and let the algorithm manage the priorities for you. So you just set an initial priority and then it goes ahead and it adjusts them on the fly. In this case, for this algorithm, it uses set time slices, measures CPU usage across the processes that are running. Idea here is that we just increase the priority of processes that don't get any time in that time slice and decrease the priority of processes that actually get to run during that time slice. So hopefully, you know, through adjusting priorities, we'll be able to be a bit more fair and let every process run. So for this scheme, we can just pick the lowest number as having the highest priority. So each process just gets assigned some priority when started. You know, we can give it names, so P subscript N. And the way the algorithm works is it just picks the lowest priority number to schedule if that process like yields and gives up its CPU time, then we just pick the next lowest number or next highest priority. And if we have to break ties, we just break it with the rival order. And if a lower priority number becomes ready, well, we immediately switch to it. So we have preemption and we assume, well, we have uh, time units, so we can't switch between time units or within a time unit, but we can between. Yep. The formal definition of preemption is you can just take some resources away. So in this case, preemption means while well, these processes are using the CPU, means I can stop you from using the CPU and take it away and manage it. So yeah, mostly operating systems like controlling resources, preemptible and non-preemptible. So preemptible is things I can take away. Non-preemptible are things I can't take away. So like if your process wants to use memory or wants to use some files or something like that, I can't just take that away willy-nilly without causing gigantic issues. So we can, yep. So if it yields, so that means it can just give up its CPU time. So it can just say, I'm done executing for now, run something else. Oh. Or it could be blocked, like it could be waiting on something. So basically means it just gives up its time. 
So how this works is we record how much time each process executes for in that, well, we can call it a priority interval. So that's like the interval of time that we will use and we'll recalculate priorities at the end of the interval. And we'll have like CN, um, we can call it C subscript N. And here timer interrupts still occur. So timer interrupts would probably happen throughout the priority interval. So we can go ahead, recalculate and maybe context switch to a new process. So at the end of the priority interval, the formula to update the priority of all the processes is, well, the new priority for process N is equal to the last priority for process N divide by two. So it decays a little bit. So it gets a bit lower. So it's more likely that this process will run and then plus however much time it has actually executed for. So if it gets to execute in that time slice, then well, we add to that. So that would get a lower priority and we would get hopefully a different process running. And then at the end of the, and the C is just keeping track of how long that process executed for. So whenever we recalculate the priorities, we recalculate the value of C back to zero for all the processes. So we get to see how long they execute for in the next one. So that's a bit wordy. So we can just have a quick little example. So we can assume for now that all processes just have an initial priority of zero. So we'll say we have four processes ready to execute and arriving in order X, Y, A, B. And the reason that they're named slightly different are they behave differently. So typically uh, with processes, there's like two main ones we care about. So A and B are called CPU bound processes. So they're just doing some calculation. They just want the CPU as much as you will give it to them. And then X and Y might be like IO bound processes. So they're processes that are blocking, that are waiting for something slower. So like waiting for the user to input something, which is really, really, really slow. Waiting for the disk to give back some information, waiting for a network, something like that. And in this case, these processes just execute for one time unit. And then we assume that they block for ti five time units. So they're unable to execute while they are blocked. So we have a timer interrupt occurring every one time unit. And then each time slice is 10 time units. And our priority interval is 10 as well. So they don't always have to match, but typically they will match. So the priority interval is just every time we recalculate the priorities and the time slice is, well, how, how long a process could actually execute for. So we want to figure out the scheduling. Well, since everything has the same priority, we have to break our tie with arrival order. So in this case, we would schedule process X. So because it's one of these IO bound processes here, so it only executes for one time unit, and then it is no longer available for five time units. Yep. Sorry, can you just explain again how priority interval is different from time slice? So time slice is like the maximum time that a process can run without getting thrown out. Um, and priority interval is whenever we recalculate the priorities. Typically they're the same. So yeah, in this case, X runs for one time unit, then it can't execute again for five time units. So the next process in arrival order is Y. It's one of these IO bound processes, so it only executes for one time unit, and then it's blocked for five. So after this, we would have A run until we recalculate the priorities. So X and Y would be ready again sometime at, you know, time equals five or six or seven or whatever. But because they're all tied and they have the same priority, well, we would just prefer to keep executing Y and or A and not context switch because they're tied. And this you could adjust if you wanted to, but typically it'll just keep on executing A. And then at time 10, we will recalculate the priorities. And yeah, here at time six, X is ready, Y is ready. We don't switch to them yet. So 
When we recalculate the priorities, well, the initial priority of all of the processes is zero, so that explains this column, and then we just add however long they ran for in that last interval. So in the last 10 time units, X ran for one, Y ran for one, and then A ran for eight. So our new priorities would be 1108, or sorry, 1180, Ooh, backwards. So in this case, well, now we have one process that has the lowest number or highest priority over everything else. So we would just execute that for the next 10 time units. And then, you know, we'd recalculate after that and keep on going over and over again. So we can, yep. Yeah. And that, that happens at the same time as A is running? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so in this case, like X and Y are blocking, they're waiting for something to happen, like the kernel like made a request to a hard drive or something like that, and then start executing another process. So we can have like a large amount of processes running at the same time. Say if I have 20 of these X, it'd be 20 of these Y. No, so there's only one process running on the CPU at a time. Which is A? Yeah, well, which is, here it's X, then it's Y, and then it's A. So there's only one process running on the CPU at a time. So what do you mean by X ready here? So X is unblocked here, so because it blocks for five time units, it means it could execute if we decide to give it the CPU. Yeah, yeah. Block just means it needs five time units because it's waiting for like a hard drive or something like that, waiting for something that's slow. So it can't make any progress until that thing is done. So it stops at one, so after five time units, we say it's ready because we could execute it again if we wanted to. But the kernel just, in this case, decides not to. All right. So we can do the same thing, but now processes A and B have a priority of six and the others have a priority of zero. So because of that, X and Y, well, their priority is zero, so we'd prefer to run those. And X came before Y, so we would run X first. Run X for its one time unit. It gets blocked for five, so it's not available again until time six. So next process is Y, runs for one time unit, blocks for five, so it's not available until time seven. So in this case, well, all the processes with priority zero are blocked, so I have to pick something else to run. So the next highest priority is a six, which is A and B, and A came before B, so I would pick A to run. Now, when X is actually ready to, gets unblocked and it can actually execute again at time six, because it has a higher priority than A, it immediately just kicks it out and we contact switch to X. It runs for one time unit and then it gets blocked again for five. And then at time seven, well, Y is ready again, so it would execute for one time unit, then it gets blocked again for five, then, while well, there's nothing else to run but A again, so A would run for the remaining two time units until we have to recalculate the priorities. And if we recalculate the priorities, well, for process X, the initial is zero, ran for two, so its new priority is two. For Y, initial was zero, ran for two, its new priority is two. For A, well, its original priority was six, divide by two, that's three, and then it ran for six. So its new priority is nine, and then for process B, its new priority is just three, because it didn't run for any time. So now because of this, well, at time 10, X is currently still blocked, and Y is currently still blocked, so the next highest priority is process B, so I would choose to execute process B for 
two more time units until x becomes unblocked. So now at time 12, x has a higher, it's unblocked, it has a higher priority than b, so we immediately execute x for one time unit. Again, it gets blocked for five, then y is ready, execute for one, gets blocked for five, and then our next highest available process would be b, so it runs for four, and then x is ready again, it goes x, and then it goes y, and then it goes on and on and on like that. So questions about this, it's just one way to just let the algorithm handle the priorities for us. Not terribly exciting, right? But it's a thing you can use. Let's go on to more exciting stuff. We still like virtual memory, right? Ish, no. What the, uh, virtual memory is great. All right, I will show you why virtual memory is great because you will appear to be a wizard because, you know, LLMs are a thing that people like, right? They're cool, they're hip, they're trendy. So if you have like a 30 billion parameter uh, large language model, well, that model itself is like 30 gigs of RAM, like it's 30 gigs large. And if you have taken this course, you can actually optimize things a little bit. So that 30 billion parameter model can actually run using only like seven gigs of RAM and how. So it's so efficient that people are like, like they don't even believe it. So we can see the discussion if it works. Uh, plus. So yeah, oh, I got the number wrong. It's only 5.8, but we can kind of read that like, I don't know how this is possible. Like, is someone smarter than me that can tell me how the hell this works? Like, how is this even possible? And we should be able to explain this because uh, we, from taking the course, should count as someone smarter than this random person on the internet. So let's take a brief detour and see. Um, wait, question. So question, how does the hard-coded priorities we saw in the previous lecture be incorporated with this? Is it just the initial priority, negative priorities get divided by two? So just depends in this. Like you can have hard-coded priorities that don't change, you can have them dynamically change, just depends on the algorithm. All right, so let's have fun with virtual memory. So we can actually control our process's virtual memory. So there's this cool system call that is actually cool called memory map. The system call is called mmap because of course we have to make everything shorter. So it is used to map files. You can use it to map files to a process's virtual address space. So has anyone like opened a file and then you know you have to do read system calls to it and it kind of sucks, right? Because you need to like declare a buffer and all that stuff. Well, this actually makes it a lot easier to actually read a file. So let's just see what that API looks like. Actually, let's just go into an example. All right, so if I was to read a file with like normal system calls, I have to like do open, I get a file descriptor back, and then I just constantly do read system calls until eventually it returns zero, and then I know I'm at the end of the file. I have to create a buffer, I have to do all that fun stuff. It's no good. So instead, we can actually do something called, I mean, memory mapping a file or m mapping it. So here, we'll be a bit meta, so I'm going to, open the file mmap.c, which is this file. So it's the current source file. So I'll open it as just read only, so I want to read it. Of course, we should be able to guess what file descriptor number we get because file descriptor zero, standard in, file descriptor one, standard out, file descriptor two, standard error. So next available should be three. So I'll just write a little assert there to just formulate, or not formulate, just make sure that what I think is true is actually true. And then 
we can see this other fun system call. So there's a struct called a stat. So it just has a bunch of information about a file and the system call fstat will fill it. So this is another system call. So we do fstat for the file descriptor, give it the address of that struct, and then it goes ahead and populates it for us. And the reason we're doing this is because one of the things it will tell us is the size of the file. So once we know the size of the file, then we can set up this mmap. So this takes six arguments, which is a lot, but we can go through them. So the first argument, the address, it's a bit silly. So you can actually politely ask the kernel like exactly what virtual address you get as a result if you want. If you say null, you get let it pick it for you. So we will let it pick it. Next is the length, so the length of the mapping. So I'll say I'll just map the entire length of the or size of the file. Next are some permissions. So what you're allowed to do with that memory. So if I have prot read, that means I'm only allowed to read that information. I can't write to it. If I write to it, I would seg fault and I'm just making sure that I actually just read the contents of the file without accidentally writing to it or modifying it. Next is the flags. So map private. What that means is what happens when this process gets forked. So if it is map private, that means it is private to this process. So when you fork, the new process can't access the same virtual addresses. And because they're mapped directly to the file, otherwise you know, you'd be mapping the same things. If you want to, there is a flag here called map shared, and that will make sure that when you fork, doesn't change anything, both processes see the same thing, and that's a way to actually share memory if you want. Then the next is the file descriptor, so the file descriptor to actually map, and then the offset, so like how many bytes into that, the contents of that file descriptor do you want to start, so we'll start at the beginning. So mmap kind of looks like malloc a bit, where it just returns a pointer, so we just check hey, is it the special mmap failed? If it is, you know, we don't handle an error or anything. We just have our assert handle it. But if we wanted to, we could check error no and all that stuff. And then after that, I don't need the file descriptor anymore. I mapped it. That's all the file descriptor was good for. So I can close it. Now, instead of doing read system calls or anything like that, well, I have a virtual address now. And what that points to is the contents of the file. So in order to read the file, I just access memory now. So I just have a for loop that goes over every single byte of the file and then just prints the character. So just a normal run of the mill for loop. And that's it. So if I go ahead and I run this, I see boom. I see the contents of the file, and I don't have to do any read system calls or anything like that. Kind of cool, huh? Yeah. I thought yesterday we used mmap to allocate memory. Yeah. So how would you do that? Yeah, so last, <laughs> yesterday I talked about using mmap to allocate memory. So this file descriptor here, you can set it as negative one, and then it's not represented by a file. It just gives you some new memory. Oh, so right now it's accessing memory. But if it's if file descriptor is negative one, it just creates Yeah, so right now it's setting up those virtual pages and it will map those to the file. Map the sorry, map what to what kind of So it will make sure that like the virtual address we get back, if we try to access that memory, we'll actually be accessing the file instead of just random physical memory. Okay. So if I don't give it a file descriptor, then that memory won't actually correspond to the contents of a file or anything. It'll just correspond to just random physical memory. And yeah, so that's one way you can share, like that's one way you can do IPC across processes. So like if I change FD to negative one, so it's actually memory and then change that flags from private to shared, 
and then I forked. Both processes have the same virtual addresses that map to the same physical memory, so they can actually share memory. And you can communicate with them through memory, which is a lot faster because, well, you just need to do an MMAP system call to set it up, and then after that, you don't have to do any slow system calls, you're just sharing memory. So that's mostly what we do. And that's fast, but kind of weird, weird and error prone. All right, any more questions about this or any weird things we want to do with it? But this is kind of cool, right? Yeah. What is the offset with respect to, like the offset in the file? Yeah, so the offset is with respect to the contents of the file. So zero just means start at the beginning of the file. If I changed it to, I don't know, let's change it to offset to, oh, then I have to recalculate my size, so I'm not going to change it, but <laughs> yeah. Um, for the, like, protection flags, mm -hmm. uh, flag, so then it can only be either read-only or write-only? Uh, yeah, so the question is for the flags, can it either just be read and read-only or write-only? So you can combine them, so you can combine them. The usual thing with these flags are like they're bit flags, so you can go ahead and do something like bitwise or, and you can do things like that. So that will let you have that memory mapping for reading or writing or end writing. So it'll set both of them. Yeah. Are reading and writing the only two options? Yeah, so the question is reading and writing the only two options, and there is at least, so there's execute, so execute is like, you can see how this kind of exactly corresponds to the flags in the page table entry too, right? So like there was, well, this would set the valid bit, but there would be read, write, execute are the main ones. Yeah? So if you set it to execute, would you be executing the entire file, or could you execute like one line of that file? No, if I set it to execute, all that means is that if there are instructions there, like I can execute instructions there. So do you execute like just the instructions or does it have to be entire So it just means that like those bits, I'm allowed to like essentially point my CPU to it and start executing them. And if you didn't have this, so this would be like some voodoo crap magic thing where I just load some raw instructions in the virtual memory and then I essentially go say go to and say go start executing that and if I set this flag they'll happily start executing instructions <laughs> um, but if I don't set that flag I'll probably get like I'll either get a sag fault or I'll get a legal instruction or some type of error in my process will just but yeah only Unless you are doing really low-level operating system things, only psychopaths would use that flag. <laughs> or if you're like trying to hack into something, yeah. As in like right now you're reading nmap.c, which is close to like a text file, not as binary as computable, right? So execute would be only just anyway? Yeah, so ex like adding the executable flag here doesn't make any sense because, I mean, they're ASCII values. Yeah. So. If I tried to execute it anyways, it would just be random instructions that just happen to correspond to the ASCII numbers and it'll probably crash and burn anyways. So it doesn't really matter. And, but write, you know, maybe I want to do write because, you know, maybe I want to just read over it and then change everything to, I don't know, an A or something like that, who knows. So if I do that, I don't get any errors. And if I remove the flag, I should see that, you know, bad things happen. So, seg fault, yay. <laughs> so, protect, so, as I'm now teaching the first years, segmentation faults are actually good because they're easier to debug than just random things occurring and then you have to try and figure it out, which I guess you're kind of <laughs> learning in lab too. But, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Like you just uh, wrote data IA, right? Like you just yeah. paste everything, but that didn't need to change the mmap.c original file? No, because I modified it after I printed it out. Oh. 
right? So I could have looped over it again, and it would just been all A's. Okay, but it doesn't overwrite the original file, right? No, it does. Oh, like the actual file? Yeah, like the actual file. Uh, that's a good question. Hopefully it doesn't. Yeah. So it doesn't, doesn't overwrite the original file. Why is that? Uh, it's just a mapping and you technically just copied the original file onto memory? Yeah, just copied it in the memory in your virtual address space and then you're just playing with the memory right. and okay. it's fine. But I think there's some flags you can do to actually like modify it and then write it back out. Well, that's just what we did, right? We had it write, and I wrote all A's to it. Without, not just in the memory, but the actual file. Like, could you end up like actually breaking your code again using that function? Like, does that make sense? So right, right now, it's just when that process is running, and then it doesn't like write it back out to disk or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah, and I forget how to force it to, but okay. this this did not. But I think there's a way to force it to, but I don't know it off the top of my head. All right, so that's kind of cool and kind of weird. So, yeah, there's our example. Anything else weird you want me to do with it? Yeah. For the example, if you have the So in this case, it didn't print out all A's because I changed the byte to an A after I printed it. Oh, but what, okay, but what if you print after you? Yeah, so if I do, like, right. So if I just, you know, looped over it again, oops, then I'm gonna see a bunch of A's. Do, do, do. <laughs> and it looks like it's screaming. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, what's the last restriction? The last what, sorry? The last restriction. Oh, it, so M unmap is basically, so like mmap is kind of like malloc, and this is kind of like free. Yeah, so it's just saying, I'm done with it. Undo that memory mapping, and then if I try and access again, I seg fault. Right, everyone li likes seg faults. I mean, they're not that bad. All right, any other questions about that? Okay, so let's try and answer, let's be smart. So, mmap is actually lazy, especially, well, even if you don't like back it with a file or anything like that. So all that mmap call will do is set up the page tables Whenever you do that, it doesn't actually read from the file. So what it actually does is it creates like an invalid page table entry during that mmap call, and it sticks some information there that's like, okay, if you, someone tries to access this, they actually want to access you know, this file through this file descriptor. So it just stores some information in that page table entry. Again, like where on disk is this entry? And then the first time we try to access that page, our MMU would call as like a page fault because it wouldn't be valid, right? Well, instead of just passing a seg fault up to your program, the kernel in its, essentially its interrupt handler can be like, oh, okay, you faulted at this page table entry. I know that's supposed to be the file. So I'll just go ahead and read a page worth of content from that file and I'll, map it and I'll, like I'll fix up the entry, read it into a physical page, change the mapping to point to that physical page, and then just let the process resume again. And then now you're actually accessing the contents of the file through that. And this actually ensures that only the parts of the file that get read, like only the parts of the file you use actually get read. So in this case, after that, if that file was like absolutely ginormous, and say, I don't know, it was, who knows, like 30 gigabytes, and I accessed the first byte on that, well, that would be on a page, 
and it would be like, oh, okay, well, I need to read a page of content from that file into memory and then set that up. And then if you wanted to just read byte, I don't know, 10 million, that would be on a particular page and say, oh, okay, I'll go ahead and read that page now and read it into physical memory, fix up that mapping. And then suddenly all you have to do is just, yeah, all you have to do is you just read two pages. It doesn't matter how big the file is. So if we go back to that question, how is this possible? So it could be a 20 gig file, 30 gig file. How is it possible that it only uses like 5.8 or 6.8 gigs of real memory? So the reason because this is, well, whoever wrote the first version of the process or program, like just loaded the entire model into memory, whether or not you used it or not. And then some very smart person who has probably taken a course like this, or at least played around with the kernel was like, okay, well, when you do model inference, they're typically sparse, you don't use all of it. So instead of reading the contents of a file that has contents I might not touch, what did they do? They M mapped it. So they just did like a one line change where instead of doing read system calls over and over again, they just did one M map system call. That was it. And that's it. They just M mapped it. That was the whole wizardry behind that. So questions about that wizardry. So they immediately cut off like was that like 24 gigs of memory that the process used by just doing MMAP. Pretty good trade-off for you know having to sit through and doing and listening to me drone on about virtual memory for a while. So you can actually get some real savings from it. And yeah, so the question: Why would MMAP use less memory here than read? So again, this is a sparse file, so we wouldn't actually access all of it. So all we have to do is actually set up the page tables. So MMAP, again, like I said, all that does is set up the page tables. So I know if I try and access that memory, well, you know, where I actually have to load things into physical memory. So if we have you know, a 20 gig file, can we come up with how much space we would actually need for the page tables? And do a bit of review. Every, everyone likes virtual memory, right? So, so I'm M mapping. A 20, let's just say 20 gigabyte file for the sake of argument. So how many pages do I need to map a 20 gig file? Assuming, yeah, no, just how many pages do I need? Yeah, so kind of. So this number, so like 20 times two to the 30 divide by what? divide by two to the 12. Yeah, so that's how many pages I would need, right? So what's that? That's like 20 times uh, to the 18, which is some weird number. So that is how many pages I need. How much space would be consumed by the page table entries? that are just required for this. So each, each page is two to the nine entries. So each page table can hold two to the nine, but just in terms of how many page table entries I need just to keep track of all these pages. So like across all my L1s, 
how many page table entries do I need? This, right? And how much space do they take up? So they'll take up this times eight because it's eight bytes for a page table entry. So in total, we have about forty megabytes. So forty megabytes for the page tables is the answer someone gave on this post. So is that actually true? <laughs> I guess no, right? Because these are all the entries that are in the L0 page tables. How many L1s would I need? In the best case, yeah. Couple kilobytes worth? Yeah, exactly how many, yeah. What do you mean, how many is this much divided by 512? Yeah, it's essentially exactly this much, like this many pages, divided by 512, right? Because, well, they can only hold 512 each, so it would be like this many pages divided by 512 which would be like 20, I think it is. Which, yeah, that is a lot. And then, well, we only have one L2 page table that we can assume to be there. So this 40 is like approximately right, but if you want to be like technically correct, then you have to keep track of the L1 page tables and be a giant nerd, I guess. So the person who said 40 megabytes exactly was wrong because they didn't account for L1s, so it's slightly higher than that. So if I have 20 full L1 page tables, well, in actuality, I will have like, so this number is, I think this is like my L1, L0 page tables. My f full ones, or wait, no, sorry, that one. So, I use 40 megabytes for my four L1 page tables, and through that, there are 10,000 for, or 10,240 full L0 page tables, and then 20 full L1 page tables. So, my grand total, I would need actually 10,260 page tables. And then the size of each one of those are going to be, you know, 4,096. And if I take that to a megabyte and like divide that whole thing by what a megabyte is two to the 20, you'll see that actually it's like 40.08 megabytes. Wow, what a difference, right? Why did we do all that when we could have just approximated it? I don't know. I'm slightly crazy. <laughs> but it kind of makes sense, right? That I would have, so if I have like a 39-bit virtual address space, that means I can address up to 500 and 12 gigabytes, and that makes sense that if I need to map 20 gigabytes, well, that's essentially like 20 entries in my L2 page table. So each entry can actually map up to a gigabyte, so it kind of makes sense. So each entry in the L2 can, if everything is full, figure out the mappings for up to a gigabyte of memory. 
And here, if you want, so yeah, the question, if we want to be specific, should we also count the L2 page table? So every process needs to have an L2 page table to exist, so you can assume it already exists. Otherwise, that process wouldn't be running. All right, any other questions or anything like that? All right, so I will be here around and use the extra time if you want to ask me about your problems with lab two. <laughs> so just remember, pulling for you, we're all in this together.